Thank you very much, Andy. He was, he, those weren't exactly the slides that he had prepared, and we had a little mix up there, so he gracefully dealt with that. Um, the winner in our human resources category is Hastrider Industries. Kylan Hastrider is Vice President of Marketing. Hello, everyone. Um, I'm really uh, excited to be here with you all. Um, I think this is a great opportunity for all of us to come together and really explore what makes our industry great. Uh, what can we do to work together to explore that with the data that we've been able to have from Modern Machine Shop? And uh, so I was told that max of five slides, so I got whopping four slides for you. So I'm just going to talk about who we are, what do we do, why do we do what we do, and then tie it back to the qualitative analysis that we're really here for. Uh, so we are a precision CNC machine shop, and the button is not working. Anyways, so we, uh, we were started in 1988. Uh, we do 4-axis uh, turning, 5-axis milling, uh, engineering, uh, design for manufacturability, and uh, metrology. Uh, so uh, Ken, the owner of our company, founded it back in 88 with a single manual lathe. Uh, purchased his first CNC machine back in 1990, and uh, I actually grew up with the, the family business. Uh, since 95, the business was actually in the basement of the house. Uh, so it was a really unique opportunity for me to grow up with the business. Um, and uh, so what happened is uh, back in 2016, we had one employee. We we're a very small company. Biggest customer was a Fortune 500, uh, all high quality, top tier work. And uh, Ken and Sandra, the owners, had a vision for a nonprofit organization. And the idea is that we're all struggling for people, the workforce development. There's a lack. And um, there we go. Um, so the, uh, the idea is uh, we want to part. So we've been developing a nonprofit. And the idea is to take individuals that are, let's just say, an inner city that are getting mentored for the first time, because we're all where we're at today because we had somebody, a parent, a scoutmaster, a teacher, and a lot of these individuals don't have that. And so what we are working on doing is, there's a lot of great organizations that are investing in these at-risk youth or young adults, but when they leave the four walls of these nonprofits, where do they go? Economically, they have no skills, they've got no education, they go back to their old environment, and they regress to where they were before. So what we're doing is we're developing our business to be larger so that we can take these individuals on and train them in a trade skill while using the nonprofit to mentor them in their personal life, family life, community life, and spiritual life. So now we're able to develop wholesome individuals from a population that historically has not, we have not been able to recruit from as an industry. Um, uh, so now that the uh, slideshows are working here, um, so we picked up our first five axis mill back in October of 2016. Uh, and at the beginning, we had one employee. Currently, we're up to 12 people now. Uh, and so 2017, that was a 75% sales growth. Uh, this year, uh, we're looking at 40 to 60%. Um, so really, the purpose of a company really defines who you are. It's not just what you do, but it's how you do it, because how you do it really comes from your purpose. Um, the first one is obvious, customers. Why do we do what we do? It's for our customers. It's the on-time delivery, it's the quality, it's the service. Um, the middle one, I think, is one that gets overlooked a little bit. Uh, we're the HR winner for the year, and uh, livelihood really comes down to livelihood for the owners, livelihood for the employees. Uh, it's not just the profitability, it's not just paying well, but it's creating a work environment where people can live and be happy. We spend how many hours a day at work, how many hours a week at work, what percentage of our lives do we spend at work, right? Um, and so we have not had a challenge recruiting. We have had more talent than we know what to do with. And why are we developing Shiloh? Because we know that that's going to run out to where we want to go down the road with the size that we want to be, right? And one of the reasons that we haven't had a challenge recruiting and why I get to be so selective with the people we hire is because of our work environment. Um, People come to work and they're happy, they're smiling. We have one vendor that came in, he's like I, like, I like coming here because people always have a smile on their face. I don't get that everywhere I go. Um, so one of my purposes in my job is to make sure that 
I'm making my employees happy. And when they're happy, they work hard. A study out of Berkeley said that a motivated employee is 37% more productive. What could you do with 37% more productivity in your shop? They're also three times more creative, right? If you're in a job shop setting, how much creativity do you need to figure out that fixturing? We're doing five axis milling. How much creativity do you need just to figure out how to work hold that and how to manage that? Um, and so we've seen an incredible impact in their personal lives and, f and, and because, then it flows right back into their work life. Uh, one of the guys we picked up, he was working 65 hours a week at another shop, never saw his kids, right? Um, what's, what's he, what is he like on a daily basis at work then, right? So by focusing on our employees, it comes right back to us as a company. Um, the third thing is community. Talking about the nonprofit, obviously community is a big focus for us. Um, why? Because I live, in, I live in the city. I'm part of that community. Um, I want my company to be more than just, hey, we made jobs, right? Um, so we actually donate 50% of our profit. Um, in 2013, Ken and Sandra were talking to uh, another Christian-owned business that were, was donating 50% of their profit. Uh, it was a local welding shop in town. And they're like, why don't we do that? You know, what are they going to do? Get a bigger truck? Get a bigger pond? Um, and so what we're doing is we're really focusing on developing the community. And what that looks like is uh, it's the nonprofit that I'm talking about. It's the donating. It's uh, the picture that I have up right here was from a STEM day uh, for the STEM Scouts. It's a pilot program through the Boy Scouts of America. And uh, what it was is it's really focusing on science, technology, engineering, and math. We're having a hard time recruiting as an industry, right? When we went in, out of those 27 kids, Every single one of them knew about 3D printing. Two knew about machining. By sixth grade, they're making career choices. So they don't know about us, but yet they're starting to make career choices. That's why we can't hire people, because they don't know about us. So what we did is we went in and we shared 3D printing with them. We had a printer right there. We machined out treasure chest boxes. And we stuck a GoPro on the five axis, machined out the box, right? gave these kids these boxes and said, here, I'll show you how to tap it by hand. We got a tapping block. And these kids loved it. They tapped these blocks by hand, screwed on the lids, had a treasure chest. Um, one of the things that astounded me is with the engraving, because it said STEM Scouts 2018 on the front and then Hostrate Industries on the back, the kids loved polishing it with Scotch-Brite. That astounded me. One of the girls was like, can I take a bunch home? I've never seen this before. You know, the boys are having competitions. Right? And when you put these parts, and we actually had a 3D model of the, the UMC 750 on it, and the, uh, you, know, you put this model in their hands, like this is an 18,000 pound machine that makes rocket ship parts that made your box. And they had a video of it. And we were able to tie together some of the uh, math labs that they do in school, and it changed their perspective. And now they're all excited about 3D printing, and now machining is right up there with 3D printing, because they all know about it. Right? And I guarantee you at least one of those kids is not going to go into the industry, right? We have to change the perspective of the younger people because we have a marketing problem. We have a marketing problem in hiring. And we have to address that at, the, at a more fundamental level. Um, so it can't just be at the high school level. We've got to get it sooner. All right. So we're here for really trying to figure out what, what makes a great shop, um, and you know, we're really digging into a lot of great qualitative data uh, through Modern Machine Shop. It's a really unique product that really doesn't exist anywhere else in our industry right now. And uh, really, it comes down to two different, what I'd say two different categories. There's the internal qualitative and then the external. And kind of got to talk about both because they complement each other and fill in holes where the other doesn't have. Um, so in terms of really improving one's company, uh, you know, we talk about uh, getting an ERP system, sitting down, collecting data, analyzing, like those four jobs, those four, uh, those eight jobs you're talking about. These ones are making me money, these ones aren't. Turns out it was swapped, right? You gotta get visibility and data on your shop floor, right? Um, if I have two different cells, I could put the same job on two different cells, benchmark them, figure out which one's working better, figure out why one's working better, compare it, make better decision making, right? And I can analyze that with our ERP, which is real track, okay? But if I wanna benchmark my company, how do you do that? 
How many of us have two machine shops lying around? We don't have that, right? So what we're able to do then is use Modern Machine Shop to really benchmark our company against other companies. Right? It's like driving a car, right? Internally, you need lights on in the car so you can actually press buttons at night. Externally, you gotta have headlights to actually see where you are in the race, so to speak. And um, uh, the uh, really uh, implementing the ERP, getting data has been fantastic internally, but uh, this has been a great way for us to take a more even global perspective um, using uh, Modern Machine Shop. So we we're very excited to be here with you all to really explore you know, what makes the top 20% of shops. And for how all of us, it's not just how do you get to be the top 20%, but how do we move the whole industry forward? So we definitely appreciate Modern Machine Shop <clears throat> for uh, you know, really pulling this all together. You probably want this back. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Who doesn't love polishing with scotch Bright? So uh, we'll just about to open it up for the audience question. Just to get you guys talking, I'd like to throw out a general question of my own. Maybe have each of you answer it. Just what is a, cha a challenge your shop faces right now? Uh, what is a constraint or an impediment to further growth? further effectiveness, further advance in the direction of the aims you have, and what are you doing to face or overcome that challenge? Jerry, we'll start with you. Um, I would say uh, hiring needs. Uh, one of our biggest challenges, it's hard to find uh, skilled people. So to find uh, skilled people in the pipeline, um, what we're trying to do is um, to target young people and offer a apprenticeship programs and opportunities uh, for training. Thanks. Peter? So we're a, we're a high mix, low volume manufacturer with a lot of setups. And a couple years ago, we invested in a multi-pallet uh, system intended to help us reduce the amount of time we had to dedicate to setups. And what we have found is that uh, we're struggling to integrate the way that system schedules work with our ERP. Our ERP is kind of a, a master or parent system. We want one source of truth. We um, want to know, you know, to interact at a detailed level. Um, and so because the, the provider didn't necessarily offer an integrated solution, we ended up creating some uh, custom uh, processes where we we take exported XML information, we sort of scan it, and then uh, pipe that back into our ERP. And I think the challenge for us is, uh, you know, through that experience, trying to define what our IT department will look like in the future. What kind of skills might we not have today that are going to become increasingly important? Um. There's definitely a long list of things that I could say are a challenge and are the reason that I'm getting gray hairs at such a young age. But I think like most of the others of us in this industry, I would have to say that finding talent is definitely the biggest challenge that we face. Um, and for us, we're finding that you gotta, you gotta kind of come up with ways to uh, teach what you have, teach the people that you have the knowledge that they need to succeed. Um, and you also have to look at how to attract talent that you might not have considered, you, you know, guys driving from farther away to your shop to, you know, to work. Um, whether, you know, some of the stuff that Kyleen mentioned was, you know, kind of very interesting to me, the programs that they have in place for their employees, different benefits and such. Um, so that's the real way that we're trying to address that the best we can. Uh, so one of the challenges for us, it's a, it's a happy challenge. Uh, so we've been a very small shop, we're growing very rapidly. In two years, we've gone up 300% in personnel. And uh, if you continue that trajectory, uh, one of the challenges, of course, is how do you continue to grow and minimize those growing pains? Uh, because we take a very long-term strategic planning approach. We don't want to plan for just the next two years or five years or 10 years, but we got to look even longer. Where do we want to actually be? And how do we get there in, in a way that is most efficient? 
And you know, how you do things as a small shop naturally is not scalable, right? So what, our, uh, what we've been doing over the last, especially year and a half, is figuring out how to make our processes more scalable. Uh, one of the ways is uh, implementing an ERP. We gotta get that traceability, uh, really create the processes that are controlled. Um, and uh, it's not easy to make scalable processes. Um, and one of the things that we've been doing to address that too is bringing on a shop floor manager uh, in, uh, actually in four days. Um, but um, it's, a, it's a happy problem to have, but any problem that you have, if you can turn it into an opportunity, that's what you want. And I, I think uh, it's, we've been taking that in stride. Are there any audience questions? All right, a hand shot up here. You could, you can try shouting it out. You can go to a, the microphone. What would you like? All right. To repeat the question, guys, which ERP system do you use? How long have you used it? How many different systems did you consider before you chose that one? Hmm? Yeah, as far as I know, um, we don't um, do that, so. Easy enough, Peter. <laughs> we use N4 Cloud Suite Industrial which is the successor to Sightline. We've used it for about 20 years, and so it's gone through multiple releases. Um, we, that selection was frankly before my time, but I can tell you, because I know our company, uh, we like to do our homework, and we, when we make decisions, we know exactly what we're getting. Our goal was, to have one source of truth and for that ERP to enable growth for years to come? Uh, for us, we don't actually have a specific ERP system, uh, but that is something that I'm really looking into, especially at this show. Uh, but we just use a couple uh, systems blended together with a bunch of spreadsheets that works pretty well for us, so, but. Uh, so we, uh, we use Realtrack. Uh, they're actually one of the sponsors by coincidence. And uh, we implemented, we bought it in 2016. I looked at about eight different ERPs. Um, I, I tend to be a little over thorough on things and what, what my points of analysis were for it, because uh, I'm assuming you're going through that process right now, is I want, so we're, we're a job shop, so we do low volume, um, aerospace, defense, energy, you know, we're, we're actually between two facilities right now. Um, so there's, uh, so that's kind of where, what our situation is. I'm not sure what yours is. And uh, we, what we're looking for is a system that was designed for machine shops. Um, and, you know, because there's a lot, of, a lot of systems out there and they tend to be for different niches or different industries. Um, and one of the things that I absolutely needed is a way to capture the actual shop floor, right? There's a lot that focus more on the accounting side but what we wanted is a system that is quick and easy for the operator to clock their operation, clock when they're done. Because especially doing you know, a job shop work, you might be, one job might take an hour, it might take 80 hours, right? And so constantly clocking in and out, how much time do you waste, right? If you waste 10 hours, or I mean 10 minutes a day, that's an entire work day by the end of the year. It's an incredible amount of time, right? So it had to be fast and efficient. Um, the next thing is that it needed to be not just analysis tomorrow, but I needed analysis today, right? So I needed to have visibility of the shop floor with the ERP, right? So I can look at the ERP and see what everybody's doing, where everything's at, if things are on schedule, if things are on time right now, because I don't need to know how I did today, tomorrow, right? Um, the, the third thing is, is uh, there's, uh, uh, a lot of systems are too complex. And when they become too complex, they become not so useful, right? Um, and what we discovered with, our, with the system that we purchased is that it was everything we needed without the additional complexity. And trying to find that right balance is, is very difficult to find. Does that answer your question or is there anything more you'd like to know? Okay. 
What a great question. I uh, met a shop owner at the show today, a friend for a long time. His shop is under new, just got a new owner, um, and that's his fear, that they're going to make him adopt their uh, ERP system. He feels like implementing just the right ERP system is a once-in-a-lifetime thing, and he doesn't want to do it again in his lifetime. Uh, it's, it defines the way your shop thinks about its work. Any other questions? This gentleman... Thank you all for uh, participating and, and sharing your thoughts um, with the group this morning. Um, most all of you have mentioned something about uh, employee training and the lack of skill sets. And I think uh, Baker Industries, you mentioned an apprenticeship program. Do any of the other companies have apprenticeship programs? I guess this may be directed uh, more towards you than Jerry. Um, is your apprenticeship program, is it a certified apprenticeship program by the U.S. government? Or is it just one that you're doing calling in-house apprenticeship because I've heard apprenticeship used a lot here in the past uh, year or so with in industry but also education and if you go on look on the US gov, uh, us.gov apprenticeship programs seem to be a little bit more specific where at the end of that program that trainee will have something tangible in hand that in a sense could be equivalent to some type of certificate some type of degree. So I was just very curious about your company's approach and if you've done any studying on that. Thank you. Yeah, that's a good question. Um, no, our um, apprenticeship program and training isn't necessarily uh, certified. Um, it's just something we do internally uh, to just try to get people in and to, you know, get them to understand about manufacturing. Um, so much of it in the last 20 years has left the states. A lot of high schools used to do a lot of shop training and whatnot. A lot of that's gone. So to try to get that back, um, we're offering that a lot to the young guys, uh, young people that are applying even for general labor positions or even uh, people that we have in our plant, uh, trying to bring them up through the ranks and, uh, and get them into specific uh, departments and train them for on the job site. Any other questions? This man back here. Oh yeah, I pointed to two people at the same time. Why don't the guy closer to me and then we'll take you next, sir. Hi guys, uh, GD and T, okay. Uh, how about, do you find that everybody, so you guys are taking uh, jobs in and quoting them and does everybody, think of GDT the same way? Does everybody, I, my experience is internally, everybody interprets it differently. So I can imagine outside work coming in, how do you interpret that and get their intent, their design intent? Um, I, you know, I've been in one place for 36 years and this, this program, I, I'm getting a lot out of it after just the first couple of hours. So mm. I just wanted to say that. Thank um, you. Being able to see how industry is doing this and the data that you guys are mining from all the country, the cross country shops is very, very informative. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. So the gentleman asked a question about GD and T. Did anybody want to jump on that? The challenge of interpreting customers design intent, how you face that challenge and how that's playing out for you. Jerry? Yeah, that's a good one. Um, a lot of GD and T we see a lot. Um, I'm actually shocked on how it looks. I know a lot of the GD and T's uh, drawings are, are done out of the states and, uh, and brought in. Um, a lot of it falls under general guidelines, but don't necessarily represent the actual part and the geometries that they are, you know, for how it's designed. So um, we interpret it on how, um, how it's drawn. And then a lot of times we spend a lot of time on the quality end in our industry, in our job. Uh, so developing gauges and quality inspection, gd and is pretty much cornerstone. Um, so I'll actually work with the customers a lot of times to try to rewrite the gd and something that'll help, you know, make it a little bit more uh, user-friendly and to kind of get them to understand uh, proper uh, tolerancing and and uh, datums. 
Any other thoughts on GD&T tolerancing, Peter? I would, I would second what Jerry said about working with customers. I think um, GD&T is uh, not trained enough um, for young engineers in school. Um, you know, our quoting process relies on kind of under-promising and over-delivering. So if we're not comfortable with it, uh, we, we have to engage with the customer. And uh, I would just sort of share that I think that's an industry-wide um, concern. Certainly something we're interested in working with uh, both customers and our own team to improve. I would definitely agree and uh, echo that. I think the big cornerstone for that is just having a very tight, close relationship with your customer. You know, they can get a hold of you within five minutes, you can get a hold of them within five minutes. You, know, you have a question, you talk, you work it out real quick and easy. It doesn't hurt the production flow, it doesn't hurt the process and time, it just keeps things working smooth and efficiently if there is a question. I would echo all three responses, and uh, I think that communication is a key component that sometimes it seems like coming from a younger person that we, I think that the new generation of emailing and all that, it just, you miss out on that communication. Sometimes a quick phone call can really uh, go far or a long way. There was a man who I, you sir? The question to Jerry at Baker Industries, which has diversified pretty extensively into additive manufacturing along with machining, the question was the use of the 3D printing capability. Is it just for work holding and other internal tooling, or is it to a large extent for external customer parts? Yeah, um, both, definitely. Uh, we use it quite a bit internally. Uh, matter of fact, when we first got our machines, uh, it was one of the first things we did was to basically use it as just another tool for us internally um, to, to make different holding jigs, different types of um, components, uh, clamp feet, and different uh, items to try to hold the work, pre work piece during machining time. Um, and then also with our own inspection equipment, um, quite a bit, a lot of the stuff that we print stays inside Baker and we don't, uh, you know, we use it for our own use on top of, you know, obviously doing a service bureau, uh, helping out the customers do the same. Thank you. Right, right now we're going through an evaluation process for uh, work holding. Uh, so we do five axis machining. So uh, if, on the slide, uh, there's like a picture of a Beethoven that we machined out. Uh, so if we wanna machine the backside of that part, uh, traditionally, we've had to machine out, you know, the, the jaws or the vices, um, and then to actually hold that odd five-axis shape part. Um, so we've been looking at actually at some resin 3D printers that are very strong and durable in the uh, additive manufacturing uh, section, and uh, scope them out beforehand. They ship you samples. You can actually take the part, throw it in coolant, see what the plastic, the resin does in coolant, um, and it really saves on your uh, custom work holding fixturing time. So I think we're looking at that to be a great solution. Other questions? Hi. Good morning, uh, Bill Berrien with uh, Pindell Global Precision. Uh, a little bit of a, uh, a micro question on the people side. Uh, millennials like flexibility. They like time off, elements like that. And so I'm just curious what your uh, um, absentee policies are and how you handle or accommodate and um, any, any evolution over there in that policy over time. You just be curious, thanks. Uh, great question. Um, uh, so I'm, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna answer that question twofold. Uh, one, you're, I think you're definitely right about that stereotype. Um, and then two, it's also more person specific. Um, and so the first being, um, if they get, if, you know, we, we, we function very decentralized. And I think a lot of millennials gravitate towards that because instead of you know, going from top down, you're simply equipping and enabling them to do their job, which inherent, so even if you gave them an eight hour time slot, they still feel more flexibility. So it's not just flexibility in when you get to work, it's flexibility during that time slot. Uh, so there's, there isn't that micromanaging. 
Um, and so if we're running, uh, right now we're only running about one and a half shifts. Uh, so we're, we're working right now on adding our second shift. Um, so we, you know, so we give the, each guys their jobs and it's just, it's up to them to get it done. And it's not us telling you need to work from this time to this time to get it done. If they get it done, if they get it done good and on time, that's what matters. So we're simply equipping them to do their job. Um, the second thing is uh, each individual tends to care about a different type of flexibility. Some like that hourly flexibility, some like just that ability to just uh, be equipped and not be micromanaged. Um, so it's, I think you're right about the stereotype. It's also more on an individual basis and it's just learning your employees. Uh, in terms of absences, uh, we've, we've been fortunate to have a great set of employees that the absences just don't happen. Uh, we've, you know, when they want to take time off, we fight to make sure that they get that time off uh, because we're there for them and because they're, we're there for them, they're there for us, right? Employee loyalty starts with employer loyalty. And so when we're loyal to them first, they show up. Any other thoughts about uh, personnel, flexibility, absentee policy, Peter? Uh, sure. Oh. Mm -hmm. Go ahead. Uh, I think to kind of echo what he's saying and what I just had mentioned before, again, it's a big thing to communicate because uh, for me, I guess I'm technically a millennial as well, and my mentality is different from some of the uh, similarly, similarly aged uh, employees in our shop. So you need to communicate with them as to, you know, what they're looking for in the job. You know, are they there just to kind of make a little bit of money and they don't want to, you know, they don't care about working more or, you know, what do they want? And then you kind of have to be adaptable to what they're looking for within reasonable terms. We define a, a PTO policy. Uh, we ask our cell leads and supervisors to manage uh, who's gone at any one time. Um, we ask everybody to submit with seven days uh, advance notice. We do not have a sick day policy. If somebody's genuinely sick, they might just make everybody else sick. If somebody, is, we watch it, and if somebody's taking advantage of it, I would consider that uh, kind of an honesty issue, um, possibly a passion issue. Ultimately, I also think that as much as people talk about flexibility, um, people also want to know that they're um, pulling their weight on a team. Mm. And I think people can flourish with some shared accountability for getting the job done. Well said. Do you have a, do you have a thought, Jerry? Yeah, we, um, <clears throat> same as what Peter just talked about, uh, accountability is critical, especially in manufacturing. So to try to, you know, the, the managers have their own right to their departments to, um, to write up individuals that take advantage or take time off or don't show up for work. Um, Baker definitely doesn't tolerate it. So there's a write-up procedure that we have in place with HR um, and HR individuals and in everybody signs it. The, the individual understands what they did wrong. Um, they're reprimanded pretty good. And then, um, you know, as far as taking time off, again, if they earn the time off um, for vacation time and whatnot, that's fine. Anything else in between that time, uh, they have to submit 30 days ahead of schedule or ahead of time for uh, for required time off. Uh, sick days and things like that are fine, but um, but there again, you know, the especially with you know, considering with the millennials, um, the the managers actually kind of. Um, can kind of feel out each individual and kind of treat those cases as they come up. Um, there again, you know, we work two 12-hour shifts, uh, six to seven days a week. So if you start seeing a pattern of that, then you kind of, it, it shows up pretty quick, you know, who's able to, to cut it and who's going to last. One of the real positives I've seen with the youngest generation of adults, the millennials, um, a whole lot of them don't know they're not supposed to like manufacturing. I'm, I'm Gen X. I was the generation we got indoctrinated against manufacturing. And uh, some of these younger people just love making parts and don't carry that baggage to it, which I think is one of the, one of the healthiest and most promising things we have on the horizon. Um, any other questions? 
Uh, so I, again, I'm pointing parallel at two people. Uh, the man wearing the blazer right there. Yeah. Economics, political question. Uh, uh, so to repeat the question, uh, the gentleman asked about steel import duties, uh, steel and aluminum, um, the political situation we're going right now. Is that having a tangible effect on your businesses? I, I think everyone's, uh, everyone's feeling that. Um, a lot of our 1018 steel comes out of Czech Republic. Uh, just the, a, lot of our, a lot of our metal comes from overseas. Uh, so we're seeing price increases on that. Um, a lot of our work is low volume, which means you, you take a lot of time to program, a lot of time to set up, then you run it. So we don't have as high of a material cost as, um, as uh, maybe a higher volume shop where a bigger percent of it is, is material. Uh, but I think the key factor for us is uh, because of the relationship that we have with our customers, um, you know, we're finally sitting down with them and saying, hey, you know, we haven't had a price increase in this incredible amount of long time, especially with the, the steel. We got to sit down and talk. And the answer from actually from the Fortune 500 was, oh, okay, yeah, we can, we can do that. That's not a problem. Um, and so it's just, you know, when, when you have everything else behind your business set up well, it makes little challenges like that that pop up just easier to overcome. You know, just all the success around the business is synergistic together. For us, um, we're more of a production shop, so the increase in material costs across the board have definitely impacted us. A um, couple of things we're doing to address that and deal with that is a lot of transparency, uh, more than I previously would have been comfortable with, but you know, showing kind of, here's what we paid two years ago, here's what we're looking at now. And the other thing is looking at ways to you know, maybe find solution to cut that cost, that per part cost, down to what it was before. Uh, you know, uh, blanket orders, you know, doubling the quantity or getting it, you know, something like that where we can, you know, m match off the increase in material costs by decreasing setup time or amortizing that setup time amongst a lot more parts. Uh, going, trying to find a solution because that's definitely a focus for our customers is that they're, you, they can't just see the, the kind of increase in cost per part that we're seeing for materials. So trying to give them options is a big thing for us. Yeah, Again, communication. Transparency, we're, we're all watching the same news. Yeah, so there is they, that they seem to really know what's going on. I mean, when you talk to them, it's not like you're not, they're, they're not, they understand, they know what's going on. Mm -hmm. So they're not, uh, surprised by it, but at the same time, they've got their customers they have to answer to, you know, so. Any other thoughts? Uh, well, I think uh, communicating with customers and getting creative uh, on, on changing processes are two really good inputs that apply to us. We, I would say, have some uh, confidence that this is not going to be a long-term issue, um, that, that there will be a settling process and that um, we're in kind of a short-term uh, situation. Yeah, exactly what Peter just said. I was thinking about, um, you know, we're not production shop. Uh, we're definitely one-off specialty tooling. Um, so our prices fluctuate from job to job all the time anyways. Uh, yeah, our, our material costs have gone up a little bit, so that just reflected in our quoting. Uh, but there again, it is it's a limited bubble I think we're in just until the US manufacturers are ramping up their manufacturing as they are now I think then we're gonna start seeing the price of that start to steadily uh, decline a little bit there was a man back here sir So my question is, um, how much time do you spend working on the company instead of working in the company? Because as a it, leadership, you know, it's a constant battle, at least for me. So that's, that's one of the questions. Do you try to have a um, certain amount of time that you allot to that every day or week or month? How, how do you, where's your balance? 
I, I wish it was as easy as having set schedules of times, because that would be great. <laughs> but we, we, we all know uh, business just constantly throws stuff at you. Um, so my official title is Vice President of Marketing Development, uh, which means a lot of my job is focusing on the company um, and not necessarily within the company. So I'm also touching HR, the strategic planning. So a big part of it is really how do we develop the company more. Um, but trying to find that balance is always difficult because sometimes that takes a back seat to the stuff that has to happen today. And um, I think the big thing is just getting the right people around you that you're able to balance that with them. Um, and, you know, really getting yourself the right team of people. If I had to actually come up with an hour total of a per week that this is what time I spend you know, on this or that, I never could. Um, I spend a lot of time at the shop and I also have about a half hour commute every day. And uh, for me, I feel like the working on the company a lot of times gets done as a multitask while I'm working in the company. You know, I'm, you know, you walk around and you see something and you think, boy, I saw that this in Modern Machine Shop a few weeks ago, you know, maybe we could apply it here and you make a little mental note and you get back and you, you're sitting there eating your lunch and it's like, hey, I was gonna, I was gonna look into this and you, know, you kind of get on Google and, and you say, you know, I think we should make a change here. Um, so for me, that's, that's a lot of the time that I spend working on the company besides just the general week or day in and day out time. I would say, uh, you know, I enjoy um, creating a standard work uh, process for myself um, uh, and, and looking at that, uh, it kind of only takes one good idea in some respect. Um, those are uh, high leverage activities. I've uh, thought about uh, um, my role at, in kind of four different categories or hats, um, strategist, catalyst, steward, and operator. Um, I'm not the, the author of that, but you know, strategist and catalyst roles are sort of working on the business. Steward and operator roles are, are uh, about efficiency. And um, I, I think that's worked really well. The other thing that I would encourage all of us to, to consider is whether our organizations have a systemic under-delegation problem. We've invested the last few months in some supervisor leadership training. It's been a game changer. People don't delegate because they're, they think they don't want to train. They think they're a bit faster at doing it themselves. They're comfortable doing it because they know they're good at it. And they're uncomfortable learning something um, that's new and you know, taking on additional responsibilities. Um, so it's really kind of moved our cheese in a way to have our supervisors undergo this leadership training. But it's been really positive. It frees up some time for that. Jerry, your time. <laughs> Uh, you know, I'm, I'm kind of fortunate, uh, the size of Baker, uh, the Baker family pretty much runs the company. Um, so I'm, even though I'm involved a little bit with, uh, the business development end and certain departments, uh, as far as the company goes, um, that's something I don't have to actually get into myself. Another question. So that, that question touched a lot, but he's asking about the, re, the resources and logistics of training, recognizing that manufacturers are largely need to train internally now, and to some extent, no doubt, each of you is, each of your businesses is doing this. What resources are you using for training? Uh, and how do you provide for trainers? Somebody who's doing training in your shop isn't doing something else, so how do you allocate that time. So I guess trainers and training tools and resources. What do you use? How do you do it? Uh, that's a great question. Um, what we usually do, um, it's, again, it's usually a lower key. Uh, the department heads uh, handle the training. 
so we don't actually have specific people as trainers per se. Uh, when we hire someone that or bring someone up uh, through the company that hasn't had that experience and, and needs training, uh, he gets on the job training. So he's the software, again, it depends on, like if he's in the design, then he's gonna be trained on that design software for that department. Uh, if he's in the, in the machining area, then it's a, it's a machine tool leader that's gonna be, be uh, training him. Um, so it's all on the job site. Um, again, if it's design or engineering, then um, you know Baker does actually offer uh, assistance to helping uh, pay for education. So if they go to night school to to go to school and, and learn some you know software uh, and get some education like GD and T courses and things like that, and then when they're at work, they're actually it's on the job training with real work. So that's how we handle that. Boy, that's an exciting topic with a lot to it. Um, I'll just see if I can answer your questions. We have a, a salary training and development manager that we hired in 2017. We went through a system selection of 20 different software programs and just decided we wanted to go with Litmos. We recently moved to Office 365 as a side note and we, we thought about transitioning to SharePoint to save a little. Um, we, we have a lot of on-the-job training and that covers anything, any process that's not already been clarified and documented and systematized. We set a goal this quarter for um, all of our team members to either teach or learn 10 hours or four 10 hours um, as, a, as an initial way of understanding um, a little bit more about what OJT was happening. We also uh, have one of our most experienced machinists in our um, tool room that's taking um, young machinists under his wing and uh, he can hold a tighter tolerance on some of those uh, manual machines than the uh, you know Lamborghinis we like to buy or that we try to. And so that's been a really nice way of celebrating the legacy of our industry and helping them understand some fundamentals. That's what we do. For us, most of the training that we do is a on the job, kind of a as needed basis. Um, we do use some third party for basic safety or the basic training as you know to start out in the shop, uh, and then a bunch of the safety and that kind of stuff. We use third party. Um, one of the things that I found as we went through our transition to ISO. 9001-2015 was the uh, area in there rec about organizational knowledge and kind of as I looked into what we needed to do to meet that, I started to realize how much tribal knowledge we had that, you know, well, so-and-so knows how to do this, so, you know, if that happens, you go get him. And, and it's you, those types of things that when you get them on paper, all of a sudden it's a lot easier to make sure that you have that and then you realize, hey, maybe someone else should know how to do this. And uh, at that point in time, you pass that, you, you kind of get that training done at that time. Um, that's a great question. It's a, it's a fun question that we've been working on because uh, we've been a small shop for a lot of years. Uh, so we don't have that history of constantly bringing on new people. So it's something that we are still working on ourselves. Um, and uh, so until we get the, our nonprofit, the Shiloh Bound program uh, up and running, uh, which will be more formal, uh, what we're doing right now is more informal. Uh, so we've been hiring pretty much only people that already have uh, a training or skill or ability. They already know how to program a CNC machine. Uh, every single one of our machinists are actually programmers because we're creating a foundation for the future. Um, and uh, so when we get these individuals, at first it was just kind of more of a throw them in and sink or swim and they learn how to you know, swim in our environment. And, you know, and so, the, so for us, it was just a continuous improvement of, okay, what did we do? How can we do better? Get feedback, work with them on a personal basis. This is what we'll teach you this, you teach us that. Because it's really just a mutual journey between us and everybody on the floor, right? And uh, so really what, it, what we do now is, you know, you, you work with them to figure out what do they know? What are they good at? What can they do? Have them job shadow somebody for an entire, let's just say week. 
you know, where they're just following them around. They're watching them program. They're watching how they function, what they do, what the processes are. Because you can tell somebody what your processes are, but it's totally different than actually walking through those processes. Um, so it's very much so on the job. And then once they start to get familiar, uh, like with our CAM programs and our processes and our machines, then you get them a simple job. And that job is gonna be probably simpler below their ability from what they were doing prior, right? But it allows us to gauge where they're at and then continue to allow them to work up. We will use uh, more formal training, such as actually sending them to one of our vendors for training, uh, like for Power Mill. Um, they've been fantastic for working with us and in, in getting people trained. Um, so it's, it's um, you know, I think the big takeaway though is that it's just, when everybody has the attitude of let's just continue improving, let's just keep making this better, let's just keep talking of what we can do to improve, it just creates an environment of let's always make it better every day. We have time for at least one more, maybe two, ma'am. How many of you already have a written continuity plan and a risk assessment, risk assessment completed? So we've been uh, working on our AS9100 and ISO 9001 certification for a while, and uh, especially the AS9100, uh, you know, the, the whole risk management is part of that. And uh, you know, whether we realize it or not, how we function on a day-to-day -day basis is always has an element of risk management to it. Um, but it's important to identify that's what risk man that, that you're already doing it. And once you identify that you're doing it, now you can identify other elements that are industry standard of how to tack that onto it. And then part of, you know, really because right now, we, we could have been AS9100 certified a while ago, right? But it would have been, we would have been certified to processes that were not scalable. You know, risk management that may not have been scalable, right? Um, so it, it's, it's timing. And uh, so for us, it's, in the, it's still in the process of being written down. And so we're, we're going through that process right now. We are uh, ISO 9000 certified, so we with the new transition, we do have a risk assessment plan in place. And uh, I was really amazed at how many things that we came up with as we went through that process that uh, really could be impactful on our company. Uh, that, you know, even some stuff that maybe I had thought of it before, maybe, you know, someone we had discussed on just a ver verbal basis, but to write that down and, and get that uh, kind of address that, look at that that need and address it, it was a big thing for us. I, I do want to throw, I, I, I do want to throw one more thing in there, um, and that sometimes, like with the certifications, it becomes so convoluted, where it's like, this is risk management over here, and I'll think about it when I have to think about it. Um, but it really needs to be something that you think about on a day-to-day -day basis. How are you gonna make your business sustainable in the future? That's really what risk management is. How do we make it sustainable 20 years from now? What about 50 years from now? Because we got employees, you know, we have no, we have zero percent turnover. So, the employees that we have 30 years from now, what's the company going to look like then? Right? They have a stake in this, and um, and so on our day-to-day -day decision making, management, it's it's about that long-term sustainability. You know, how much debt do you have? We're not leveraged. We're not in a position where we'll be, uh, you know, where we're threatened. Um, so, it, you know, when you're, buying, when you're buying tooling, what's the risk of, you know, this vendor versus this Chinese vendor versus this reputable one versus one that you have no clue about, right? You're always making that decision making of, you know, uh, how is this going to impact my business today and what's that going to do for my sustainability? And it's really, it's not just this, it's not this convoluted, I need to go do risk management and this, you know, the corporate execs go do that. It needs to be you know, permeated throughout the whole business where even the machinist thinks about the sustainability of their machine, of their work cell area. Uh, and it, it really needs to be throughout the whole uh, company culture. I would just quickly say, um, your first question was around continuity planning. We have annual career conversations that help us put people, kind of move them towards developing their, their gifts and abilities. That really has, fueled our continuity and succession planning uh, program. On uh, risk management, uh, the tool that we use is called QuickBase. 
uh, it's not specific to risk, but it allows you to build databases on the fly. We have a living document that not only helps with our ISO certification, but anybody can add a, a risk. Um, our leadership team re then reviews that. This year, uh, we picked several uh, what we call single points of failure in our production process, and we've just been going through um, a lot of ideas about how to address that, uh, which of course our customers appreciate. So that, that's what we do. So we can squeeze in one more question, uh, sir. question is, you've got a high skill uh, employee, you'd like to use him for training, do you run into that situation and how do you accommodate that situation? So for right now we're a small company so it's pretty easy because we're all in proximity with each other. Uh, so it's easy for that uh, knowledge to just naturally transfer. Um, but uh, w instead of just flooring them into the company or classroom training, that job shadowing, you basically pick the right skilled person um, for that person a job shadow. So if this person is going to go, you know, focus more on, uh, you know, four axis machining, they're going to go work with this person on HSM. If this person's going to be more complicated parts, this person's going to job shadow the person who's programming power mill with the really complicated stuff. So really that person, that employee that is the one doing like the, 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 the one who's being job shadowed, you know, that person is really trained to then train that person. So that, um, you know, you pick a person for that knowledge transfer, which means really any employee could be picked for that knowledge transfer. It really just depends on, you know, you, you, you have to make sure that they know how to transfer that knowledge. So you gotta train the trainers uh, and really, uh, it's, you know, we're, we're a very decentralized company, so it's really just about enabling the right people to just kind of do their job. Um, it's, it's, it sounds simple, but so many times we make things complicated. I think uh, kind of the, the thought that you might have had in mind when you asked that question is, if you have a highly skilled employee, uh, a, how do you get them to train someone without thinking that they're, that person that they're training is going to be a threat to them? And again, I think you have to have that communication there that, you know, as to why you're thinking of why you want this other person trained, you know, and make sure that that highly skilled employee knows, you know, hey, I, I see you as a big part of this in the future, uh, but I want to I want to double that ability and have someone else that's right there alongside of you and also can make your life easier. And when you get that communication across, then all of a sudden that breaks down that barrier, I think. And I think the other big thing too is the self-training, uh, where you know, our company has a vision. We're not just there for the money. We have a technological vision, we have a social vision. So now these individuals, they're not just there for the money. They, they grasp on the mission and vision, and then they start to gravitate towards the technological vision, because we're very progressive with our technology. So then the individuals, we work with them to say, where do you fit in with these different technologies that we're going towards? Um, and then the individuals, they take the initiative to say, okay, I'm gonna work on learning this. Um, and you, know, you, can, you can teach someone, but you really gotta motivate them and enable them to be motivated to simply, ha you know, for themselves to go and pursue that technology. Um, Peter or Jerry, anything to add about high skill internal trainers? I would say that, you know, some people are good at training, some people aren't. Um, so it's, it's really beneficial for us to have a multi-faceted approach for the subject matter experts. Uh, we've had good luck with our training platform, documenting what they know, maybe some GoPro videos, you know, online that others can watch. Um, it, for those that, that enjoy coming alongside other machinists, then we try to schedule that as well. Um, but we have not found a, a one-size-fits-all works best. We tend to, you know, work with the expert in that matter and sort of figure out how best to carry on that knowledge. Real quick, um, the other point I wanted to point out is um, there's definitely, definitely different levels of training. Um, so we will use different 
personnel, uh, experienced machinists or designers, um, or you know, metrology personnel, uh, depending on the level of the individual being trained. So he'll may go through and shadow or work with um, multiple people throughout his training course. And it could go on for, for years, depending on how well he picks it up. But he'll actually end up going through uh, like a beginning stage with, with one individual. And before he actually gets to someone that we've had in our company for 20 years uh, that's operating, you know, one, one, some of the most uh, sophisticated machines, you know, someone's not going to be trained by that person until they're there for a few years at least.